Um, as we continue in our series in the book of James, uh, the sermon today is entitled, Submit to God Against Worldliness. Submit to God Against Worldliness. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. If you don't have your Bibles with you, uh, we'll have the words on the screen for your encouragement. This is the word of the Lord from James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers, for the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. For there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we gather as your church not only in this place, but across this world today, to place ourselves once again humbly um, in your presence of righteousness, of majesty, and of glory. Lord, we come with heavy hearts because we do live in a broken world. We come with heavy hearts because we ourselves have broken hearts and desires where we seek after our own satisfaction above all other things. And yet, Scripture tells us even this morning that you give more grace that you continue to invite and invest and mature and grow within us by what is only your majesty and mercy. And so as your people, under the authority of who you are, as we gather, would you reveal yourself to our eyes in the Spirit? Would you not only reveal but convict? Would you continue to mature and sanctify and grow us in the likeness of your character? And Lord, would you not only help us in being aware of what, who you are and what you're doing in this world, but help us to go beyond our own comfort, to be the hands and feet, to deliver the, not only the news, but the effects of your grace to the ones that you have given to us to call brother and sister and neighbor. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I love you. I do. That's kind of the guiding thought for my... Thanks, to you. <laughs> Uh, for my preparation this week, and I've been thinking about this for a couple of reasons. One, today's text is pretty heavy-handed. Um, two, I've been realizing that as I'm preaching to the gospel to us, um, it's been getting harder and harder to do it out of a uh, desire to build up and to inform and to grow us. Um, it's not because of anything you've done or I've done, but um, I think when you're in an office and you're studying, it's so incredibly easy for it to become su subjective, for it to become information. And so, especially this past five days as I've been praying and preparing for our church, our leadership, myself and you, um, as I've been hearing stories, I've committed and I've resolved to letting you know that I love you. And I know that we're a pretty introverted church and you might not say it back to me, so I'm just going to assume that you love me too, unless I hear differently. Um, but I wanted to begin with that today, because we're talking about something that is not only true, because it's according to the Word of God, but it challenges the very nature of the entirety of our lives, of how and why and for what you and I live, 
And hopefully in the gentleness, but also in the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we are able to leave these four walls today and to prayerfully consider how we are wrestling with worldliness and whether we are truly living as self-professed Christians who accept the grace of God, whether you and I are truly living under the authority and the calling of what that means for us. When I was 23, uh, I was within the first year of seminary, and in one of the pastoral care classes, we were assigned to go to a neighboring elderly care home to learn how to give pastoral care to people who were towards the later stages of their lives. And this care facility was filled with not only the elderly, but they were filled with the elderly who were sick, who had been abandoned by their families, who never had any visitors. And to a large degree, this facility constantly reached out to various churches locally in the seminary because there was such a heart of bitterness there that, they were, that there were lifelong Christians who towards the end of their lives were losing hope and were incredibly angry at everyone. Now imagine a 23-year-old who had just begun seminary going to this elderly care home and being assigned to, this man, assigned to this man who was in his late 80s, whose name was Jim, who had lived his entire life as a Christian school teacher, who had raised a family, whose children had gone out into the world to do great things for the kingdom of God, and yet he had not seen his family members for 15 years, and who was sitting alone in his room and spent 90% of his life looking at a television. He was not ready, nor was he willing to engage with anyone, especially a 23-year-old pastor, a neophyte in seminary. And so I walked into that room with heavy expectations, with, I'm going to inspire and encourage this old man. And I sat down and I said, hi, my name's Paul, and I'm here to just be, just be the presence of God. What a, what a dumb thing to say. <laughs> and this man didn't even look at me, and it was awkward. So I said, so, uh, Mr. Jim, uh, how, are, how are you today? Immediately losing all of my fervor all of my passion to be the presence and love of God, and he didn't even look at me. He didn't acknowledge that I existed. But I needed my hour, so I didn't get up and leave. And so I sat there for our first session for three hours, and we watched all of the afternoon talk shows, Ricky Lake, Jerry Springer, and he didn't even breathe in my, in my, in my direction. The next week, the same thing. Hi, I don't know if you remember me, because of all the visitors you have, but my name is Paul. The third week, finally, I just walked in there and I sat down. I had lost all desire to be there. I just sat down next to him. And after the first talk show ended, the second talk show ended, finally, in my last 30 minutes there, I said, I understand if you don't want me to be here, but honestly, I have to be here for seminary. So if there's anything you'd like to share, I'm all ears. And he simply looked at me and said, what do you know about life? And what do you know about God? I said, you're not wrong. The third session ended. The fourth session, the fifth session, and finally it was the sixth and final time that I would be visiting Mr. Jim. And I walked into the room just looking forward to my three hours of afternoon television. And finally I said, this is my last visit. I know that we haven't talked, but I just want to let you know that I see you and that it must be really difficult. And this is our only conversation we had in six weeks. But here's what he said. He said, do you want me to ask you one question? And I said, sure. And he says, well, how about, that? How about you ask me the question because I don't like asking questions. So I said, why did you? Okay, anyways. So I asked this old man who had experienced a long life and raised a family and worked in for the church and within the Christian education you know, departments and all this stuff. And I said, what is your greatest struggle in life knowing that you don't have much time left? And I was expecting this like mountaintop spiritual answer. And he thought about it for a few minutes. And after the commercial break finally ended, he looked at me and he says, I'll answer you. And I was expecting this life-changing thing. And he simply said, green jello. And I said, what? <laughs> Internally. But externally, because I'm a pastoral seminary student, I said, well, tell me what that means. What does green jello mean? <laughs> and he said, all I have left in this world is green jello. It's my favorite food. 
And I said, well, if you told me earlier, I could have brought you packets and packets of green jello, and they would have prepared it for you in the kitchen. And he said, no, every day we have jello provided for us at lunch and dinner. And every day, that's the only thing that I want in this life until I die. That's my one thing that I look forward to. And I said, okay. Didn't know how to answer that. How do you respond to someone who says, I live for green jello? And after a few more moments, he said, honestly, my biggest struggle isn't just my desire for green jello, but I want all the green jello. It was getting kind of weird, and I was getting kind of uncomfortable. And I said, what does that mean? He says, I not only want to eat my jello, but I'm, I'm discovering that I want my neighbor's jello at the lunch table. And I not only want to take it from him or her, I want to take it from them, and I want them to feel bad. And I want to make sure that they know that I took their jello. And he says, I fantasize about walking into the kitchen and getting the huge bowl and platter of jello and yelling at them that this is mine. And my greatest struggle right now is to not do that, to not cause other people anxiety or stress or anger. This was not the answer I was looking for. I mean, I like jello, but I don't think about it. I don't fantasize about it. And I don't think about stealing your jello, because after a few bites of jello, it's jello. You're done. And so I walked out, and I thought about that for about a week. What is the spiritual significance of this idea? And after talking about it with our professor, my professor simply looked at me and smiled, and he said, this is the core of all sin, isn't it, Paul? And I looked at him, and I said, green jello is the core of all sin? And he said, no. And this is something that has shaped my perspective on ministry since then. He said that all conflict and sin returns to selfishness. Every sin, every broken ideal, person, action, word, thought, the very root of sin, no matter what it might look like or sound like or be, simply returns to selfishness. And he said, look at Genesis and look at original sin. The devil tempted Adam and Eve not by telling them, here, this is what you should do, but he, he tempted them by alluding to their vanity. You can be like God. You can have this. You deserve it. This is about you. And therefore, Adam shirked his responsibility as a man in protecting and serving his wife. Eve fell to temptation and ate and took the fruit and gave it to her husband. And this is a guiding principle for us in the gospel because we recognize, especially in the text today, that there's a tension between worldliness, selfishness, and vanity versus what the gospel calls us to in the ideal of justice, righteousness, and grace. Something that centers on the character and personhood of God. Curtis powerfully prayed and led us in a time of reflection today, and I'm sure you've all heard of it in the news, that Russia has invaded the Ukraine. And what I find striking about this is not simply that war is horrible, or that I see updates on the news of people bloodied and buildings being bombed, but what I find interesting and, and, and convicting to myself about this is that we are so willing to post on social media, pray for Ukraine, pray for Ukraine, donate to Ukraine, and yet we are unwilling to look in the mirror at ourselves thinking about how just as countries wage war upon other countries because of vanity, selfish desire to grow or gain in power, we do the same thing in our lives with one another. We hate, we curse, we judge, we speak evil and ill will against one another. And this is the same thing, and it returns to this ideal of green jello. Our desires and appetites are higher than the glory and command and righteousness of God. So how do we live in a world not only that is broken by sin, but how do we live with hearts that are broken by sin? And what grace does the gospel afford us? James begins the first five verses of the text today by asking, what causes the effects of sin? What causes fighting, quarreling, division, hatred, hardened hearts among you. And he says to us that it is your misplaced and selfish passions. Passions meaning the desires of our hearts, 
that are not submitted or surrendered to Christ as Lord and Savior, but we misplace the value of our passions, our desires, our hope, the things that we pursue after as according to our own selfishness. If our passions are misplaced, that means that there's a correct place for them. If something is lost, that means in, 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 invariably there's a correct place for it to be so that it's not lost. And we were created in a way to be intimately tied with the glory and the righteousness of God. We were created to have our passions in line with who God was by his perfection, grace, and mercy. Adam and Eve intimately knew God, talked with God, and walked with him in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden. Their identity, their desires, their hopes, their passions were in line with who God was. But in our sin, we desire wickedness and earthly things to satisfy not God's call to us, but to satisfy our own vanity, our own selfishness. And this selfishness leads us to hate. This selfishness leads us to mock, to judge one another. I'll never forget this idea that we are inherently broken. Not we don't learn to be sinful, but you and I, from the moment of our conception and birth, you and I are broken by sin. And it's evident by the fact that seven-month-olds will fight one another for their parents' attention and for toys and for food. I've seen children raise up their pacifier and hit other babies in the head because they want something that that baby has. It's not a learned thing. It's a part of our brokenness in our DNA. We have misplaced our passions and our hopes. James says that we covet because we don't receive, so we fight and quarrel with one another. We don't receive good things because we don't ask God. And when we do ask God, we ask God with selfishness and we want to use God for our own gain and benefit, not in surrender to him. In verse 4, he points his fingers at the church and James says to the church, you are an adulterous people. You are an adulterous people. And this illustration of marriage pervades in the gospel, especially in the New Testament, because marriage is not an end in itself, but marriage is this symbolism, this reflection of how intimately tied you and I are with God. We are married in body, mind, spirit, existence, intention with God, just as a man joins with a woman to become a married couple. But he's saying to the church, you are an unfaithful spouse. You say one thing and do another. You betray you cheat, you lie, you steal. No matter what you say, your desires and passions are misplaced. And he closes the first section by simply saying, church, friendship, or love for the world in defining and guiding and leading who we are. Living our lives according to worldly standards is not just disobedience, but it's war against God. You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God. There are no two masters to serve. It's one or the other. If you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God in your brokenness and sin. For God is jealous over his spirit that he has given us to empower. Now notice the two things that he says to us in the first five verses. He says we covet in our sinfulness, and yet God is jealous. Are these the same thing? Jealousy and covetousness? No. If you didn't know this today, it's a learning experience, so here we go. To covet something is to want something that someone else has, and like Jim in, in, the, in the opening illustration, to not only want something that someone else has, but for them to not have it, and to hurt them in that process. Amandi has beautiful arms, because he works out all the time. Now, if I covet that, it's not only that I want arms like a Mandy, I don't have the desire or the time or the commitment to pursue that. But if I covet it, that means that I want to be as fit as a Mandy is, but I then, in turn, want to gain what he has, but I want him to lose what he has also. I want him to become scrawny or 900 pounds. And for you know, Elena to say, you, you're scrawny, I'm breaking up with you. Would never happen, because you're not with him for his body, he's a good man. All right. That's a sinful thing. We all like that one? Okay. 
That's a sinful thing because you're not only wanting someone, something or someone that doesn't belong to you, but you want to hurt the individual that has it. That's sin. Jealousy, on the other hand, because we never refer scripturally to God being covetous, but jealousy, on the other hand, simply means I want what is rightfully mine. Now understand what I'm saying here. I want what is rightfully mine, what belongs to me. So in verse 5, when James says to the church, God is jealous of the Holy Spirit that he has given you. What he's telling the church is that you belong to God inherently. He created you. He knew you before you were even conceived. Your identity, the image of God is imprinted on you. And yes, you are broken by sin. Yes, you have been unfaithful. Yes, you run away. But the sheer grace of God is that he still calls you mine. Not because we are worthy, but because his love is so over-encompassing and covers us even though we are unworthy. God is jealous over the spirit that he has given within us to live in, to instill, to convict, to inspire, and to empower us to become his own. How can we receive God's grace and everlasting love and profess to accept it in faith, only to have this so-called love be adulterous, to be unfaithful. This is not right. It's unjust. He continues in verses 6 through 10, where he implores the church simply to submit to God and trust in his faithfulness. In verse 6 he says, even in our current state of brokenness, God gives more grace. God gives more and more and more to overwhelm us. This is an astounding thing. And this is the nonsensical nature of what the gospel gives us in the grace of Jesus Christ. It should floor us every time we hear the gospel. That the astounding nature of the love of God is so beyond not only what we deserve, but it's so beyond our understanding, and it's so beyond what we could even think about and hope for. And yet God not only provides, but he generously and lavishly pours it out, despite the fact that daily you and I scream and run and kick to get away from him. I don't have a love like that. I don't. I don't have a love like that for my wife. I don't have a love like that for you. But the love that we are called to and defined to live in and out of and trust is not a human love, but it is the very grace and gospel of Jesus Christ. But God gives us more grace. And because of this grace, James says, submit yourselves to God. Be of subject to him first. And this Greek word, hypotagete, simply means to be his and his alone. We don't like this word subject, submit. We don't like it because it means that we have to necessarily, by definition of this world, say to God, even though this sounds ridiculous, you are greater than I am. Inherently, we might be able to sing it in a song. Christ is enough, and it's beautiful. And I was floored by that this morning as our praise team led us in worship. But it's a different thing to sing that in a praise song and then yet to live it out to obey, to submit, to surrender, and truly say to Christ, you're greater than I am. You're enough, especially in in the light of me having to make a decision to discern wisely whether I want to satisfy my own selfish soul or or I want to glorify and honor and submit to Christ. To submit to Christ means to place ourselves under his defining, his direction, in his driving of all aspects of our lives. To be of subject to him. It's not just a command that James ends with, and this is the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? The Holy Spirit inspiring James to write and convict and challenge the church to faithfulness. James James calls the church to submit ourselves to the gospel, and he gives us two promises. Promise one, and the second half of verse seven is this. As you submit to God and trust in him alone, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil as you submit to the authority of God over the authority and temptation of the, gospel, or of, of the devil, 
which we use as an excuse, as in the devil made me do it, or I didn't want to, but I was tricked into sinning, which is a lie. But if we submit to the authority of God and resist the temptation to sin that the devil lies us to, the promise is that we will already, we will not only be victorious, but we are already victorious. And not only that, but the devil will flee. And I don't think the church talks about this enough. We don't talk about defining the devil and telling the truth about Satan. But the promise that the devil will flee reminds us that the devil is by nature a lying bully. Bullies, once challenged, once punched in the face, will not persevere. They will run in fear. Satan is already under the foot of Jesus Christ. The victory is already won. This, is, this truth is not negotiable. The problem is, is that you and I live as if Satan has almost the same, if not the same authority, of Jesus Christ today in our lives. James says, if you are submitted to God and under the protection of his glory, you have nothing to fear. Resist the devil. Fight back. Confess. Repent. Endure in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And if we do this, the devil will flee in fear, for he already knows that he has been defeated. The second promise that he gives us in the first part of verse 8 is that as we submit to God then and trust in him alone, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I know this is hopefully for us a simplistic idea of the gospel, but isn't it shocking and amazing that we have such a desire to know God and to be known by God. We have such a desire to be established in a community of faith and to have fellowship and have people we can turn to and share our lives with. We all have this innately, especially through the pandemic, but yet even though we have this need, this desire, this want within us, how many of us are actually willing to go and actually draw near to God, to draw near to one another? What we're actually saying then, when I want fellowship or I need fellowship, is I want people to stop what they're doing in their lives and I want them to come and serve me and love me when I want it, how I want it, and if I want it from that person. That's not fellowship. That's not drawing near to God. But the command and the promise that James gives us is if you draw near to God, there is no guessing there. God will, and he's always prepared to, And he yearns for and desires to have you not only draw near, but as you come to him, he will overwhelmingly come to you. He will meet with you. He will answer you. He will engage you. This idea of drawing near is to live in a maturing and growing intimacy, love, and knowledge of God. Drawing near to God does not mean, and I'm not expecting the church to be here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Please don't. Go to work, feed your kids, be a good spouse, be a good friend. Live your lives for the glory of God outside of these four walls. But drawing near to God means that we live in submission to Christ as Lord. We live in every part of who we are to obey and honor and glorify him. And we live to not only know him, but to grow in what we know and what we love about God. To know him. Maybe help us better understand this. I have a friend who's in his mid-40s, and he has a crush on someone. He lives not where she lives. I'm trying to hide this, because if he's listening, then I don't want him to feel embarrassed. They live, it's long distance. And this is one of my best friends growing up. He's my guy. He doesn't like me very much. (laughs) We're going to see each other in a couple months, and I already know what's going to happen. I'm going to get off the plane, he's going to get off the plane, we're going to see each other. And I'm going to be like, I missed you so much. I love you. How have you been? And he's going to simply, with his crossed arms, look at me and be like, all right. It's nice to see you, I guess. And it's infuriating because when he talks to my wife on the phone, his voice changes and he likes her a little bit more. But I'm like, I'm the one that's known you for 30 years. But it's okay. I'm secure. But he, he, he has this female interest. He live, they don't live near each other at all. But what makes me jealous and kind of upset about it is that because he's interested, he flies to the city that she lives in regularly to spend time to eat, to get coffee, to go to the grocery store, to share even mundane moments of life together. I want that. He has yet to visit me here, and I've lived here in a year, and he's like the pandemic. If you loved me, you would come here, wouldn't you? 
But the interesting thing is that as he's gone and visited her multiple times over this past year and a half, apparently the pandemic applies to visiting me, but not her. As he's gone, the interesting thing is that their relationship, as he draw nears to her, their relationship is blossoming. They're not only getting to know each other and spend time together, but they are, but they are growing in their affection and their love for one another. We are willing to do this with the man or the woman that we are attracted to. And this is the same thing, though, that we neglect or ignore or reject when it comes to God. The promise of James, though, is that it's not in your perfection, but in your faithfulness and surrender to Christ. If you draw near to him, God will draw near to you. Living in a way that knows, that loves, and that seeks to grow in who he is, God is faithful to answer. We cannot receive and know him if we do not ask, seek, and knock. All this leads to James's encouragement for the church. And if you've been listening throughout our service, we often use this as a call to confession, don't we? He says, humble yourselves. Confess and repent. Be wretched and mourn. And this isn't about the, James saying to the church, you are horrible people, so live in your sin. But he's saying, understand the loftiness of God and understand the wretchedness of yourself and in humility, submit yourselves to God in confession and repentance. For if you are humbled before him, he will lift you up. He will meet you. He will raise you up. And he will say, by his love and not our accomplishments, you are mine. And he closes in the final two verses in giving us practical ways to submit ourselves to God in opposition to worldliness. And it simply is summed up in this. Stop judging one another. Stop actually hating one another, and do not speak evil against one another. I find it tricky and interesting that he closes his practical nature in the final two verses with this. He doesn't say stop plotting. He doesn't say tithe more. But the final practical encouragement that sums up this idea of submitting to God and loving one another out of godliness is to simply watch what you say and be sure to not judge and hate somebody else. The early Christian church, their sinfulness was no different than ours. What they wrestled with as a community was no different than ours. And from the beginning of time, since sin entered into the world, humanity has wrestled with this idea of judgment and speaking with hatred. We have, we do. And it might not look as clear. You might not write me emails saying, Pastor Paul, I hate you and you're ugly. I have yet to receive that type of email, but I've heard pastors receive, you are less than attractive in the emails. I don't know. But we do this. We judge each other. We speak ill against each other, maybe in subtle ways, in cliquishness, in socially ostracizing someone and rejecting someone, in not doing our responsibilities as church members or servants of the church. We judge and hate passively, especially for a predominantly Asian congregation. This is our sweet spot, isn't it? We let each other know that we are unsatisfied passively. We don't show up. We don't try. We don't participate. We don't obey. This is possibly one of the weird things that you've had to adjust to me, and I've had to adjust with you as, as personalities, hasn't it? I've been told that I'm very direct and conflict-oriented. Not really, if we have a problem, I'll go, I just want to go up to you and say, hey, we have a problem. Can we work it out? But people are like, too much, too much. I'll work on it, if you work on it too. But this is the practical thing that we are encouraged by. The world says you are the most important thing. Your opinion and your feelings, not even fact, but your opinions and feelings are more important and valuable than anyone else. You are enough alone. So you are judge, you are jury, and you are executioner. You don't need humility. You don't need reflection. You don't need nuance. What you think goes, and that's it. And yet James's, James's encouragement to the church and the gospel is we are all submitted to Christ, and none of us are worthy. And as we are humbled before the cross, speak to each other lovingly and not judge. Speak to each other with kindness and generosity and mercy. 
and do not relegate someone to spiritual death. Now, I want to be very clear here. This doesn't mean, when his warning against judgment does not mean for the church, ignore sin. You don't ever have to disciple or discipline anyone. That's not it. Because ignoring sin is not loving. Discipling and disciplining someone, disciplining someone in a humble love to see them foster, to see them uh, grow in the gospel is not sinful. It's love. But he's saying anything that is filled with hatred, vanity, and selfishness, and judgment to another, and how you speak, and how you treat them, we should not, not only do that. We should not only not do that. Sorry, poor choice of words. But that is sin that is rebellion and war against God. What does this mean for us? The first question is, where do your passions truly lie in the gospel? What directs and drives your life, my life, our lives together? Why do you wake up in the morning? And this is why I began this sermon with I love you. But for many of us in this room, our entire lives are based on a worldly understanding of living for my own glory, my own pleasure, and my own satisfaction. And the shocking thing of it is, is that we have lived these lives for so long that we think of them as truth. I go to church, I tithe, I'm a Christian, I serve. But we don't see the fact that we do these things to satisfy maybe our guilt, but we are not actually submitted to the glory of God. We don't actually see him and humble ourselves before him as Lord and Savior and King. And we don't actually see one another as fellow children who have been redeemed and called by the gospel. We have our in crowd who are worthy of our attention, and we have the out crowd who we judge and hate. Why do you work? Why do you raise kids? Why are you married or dating? Why do you study? Why do you show up? Why do you treat someone a certain way? Why do you speak in a certain way? Where do our passions and true desires lay? For where our passions lie is where our eyes will be fixed. And where our eyes are fixed is inevitably where you and I will go. It's important to think of this. It's important to reflect. It's important to pray. It's important to humbly come before the Father in confession and repentance and ask the Holy Spirit, would you open my eyes to why I do what I do in every capacity of life. The second thing I want us to consider is that the faith, practical submission, actually submitting to God, requires an act of faith. It's not something that you are going to do on your own. Submission to God is not merely a matter of what we know in our head or a matter of what we feel in our hearts, but it's about recognizing Jesus as Lord and living in a way that bears evidence of that in our lives. I've said this before, and it works really well, but no matter how much I say I'm a panda, and if I go up, climb up a eucalyptus tree and eat the leaves, no, never will there come a day where I actually am a panda. Because I want to watch TV. I want to eat pho. Things that pandas do not do. But are we living in submission to Christ as Lord and Savior, and bearing fruit of that in the Holy Spirit, living and reigning in our lives as evidence of our obedience to the gospel. It's not what you know. I'm sorry to tell you this today. It's not who you listen to. It's not what you feel. It's not even what you think. But can we see a growing evidence of godliness in our lives? I can tell you what you're submitted to. I can tell you what you love by the fruit of who we are and what we do. The final thing I want us to consider is that submission to Christ is not individual, it's corporate. We can't be submitted to Christ alone. It's something that we have to do together. It's not just leaders of the church, but as members of the church, if we are truly submitted to Christ, a snapshot of what that might, might look like, we show up to support and love one another. We speak up to defend, encourage, and build one another up. We don't only seek to receive as a church, Feed me, feed me, feed me, satisfy me, organize and serve and do what I want you to do. But we show up simply with open hands before God and one another and say, how can I pour into you? How can I encourage? How can I participate? How can I encourage you simply by being here 
not only because it's good for me or I had a free Friday, but how can I serve to honor and build you up and to glorify God ultimately through that? The greatest obstacle to living life obedient to God, beloved, is ourselves. We have to look in the mirror on this. The cause of division among the body of Christ is not the other party, but our inability, our unwillingness to listen, to hold on to, to forgive, to humble ourselves, and to love one another. I find this incredibly convicting. There's nothing more challenging than to love someone, isn't there? Because loving someone is not only loving them when it's easy. Anyone can do that. But loving someone truly is put to the test. It actually bears fruit when it's hard to love somebody, when it costs you something. And beloved, I'm here to tell you today that the gospel tells us that you and I have been loved, not when we were lovable, but when we were unlovable. And that God has poured out his grace to eternity for us. And this is what we are called to be submitted to, to obey, to trust, to know, and not to perfectly, but to faithfully practice in growing in the likeness and character of Jesus Christ. It's ironic that we talk about war. There is war in this world. There is brokenness, and it frustrates me to no end. It frustrates me because it shouldn't happen. Children, mothers, fathers, shouldn't be called away from their well-being and their families to go fight for a nonsensical reason especially when it comes to the fact that all sin and brokenness at its core is vanity, is selfishness. And this is a Christian ideal. It's a way that a Christian should feel and think and respond in, according, in according, accordance to sin in the world. We should not celebrate it. We should be saddened by it. We should pray constantly. But again, loving is not doing, is not doing something when it's easy, but loving is doing something especially when it's difficult. And the loving thing of, for Ukraine, for exploitation, for hatred, for all the conflict and brokenness in this world is not just some, simply say, pray about it, but to actually pray, or to post, give about it, give to help, but to actually give. But it's also to look in the mirror and say, how am I as a child of God today, living in a life that is submitted to Christ? And how am I making peace or sowing peace in, in my life now how am I building others up? And how am I living in a way that is truly submitted to the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can we draw near to God? Final five points. Less than ten seconds, so hear me out. James calls the church today to submit to God in humility. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Wash your hands of sin through daily confession and repentance, and grieve and mourn our desire to sin and love ourselves more than one another, and especially the glory of God. And finally, do all things in trusting humility and faith, that as we humble ourselves, Christ will raise you up. He will raise us up. Is that more than five? That's six, sorry. I'm the biggest critics in church right here, front and center all Sunday. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you are enough. And we thank you that even when just the destruction and ugliness of ourselves is brought up, and it should be brought up, Father God, because we cannot ignore or lie away who we are in our brokenness, that you not only accept us and call us children, but you increase in your favor and grace for us. Father, what an astounding thing the gospel is. What an astounding thing your grace is. But in the spirit, would you help us not only to be surprised by it, but would you help us then to submit in faith, to surrender, to say that you are greater and above and enough, and to fully submit all of our lives, our words, our beings, our desires, our purposes, everything according to who you are and what you have done and according to what you call us to. Would you strengthen your people at this time? Would you mercifully open our eyes to see really the depth of our wretchedness? And Father, would let our sin truly be bitter so that only you would be sweet. We thank you that this is according to your mercy. We thank you that this is according to your power. 
We thank you, Lord, that even though we struggle with this vanity and selfishness, that your faithfulness would carry us through to persevere and to mature and to grow in your likeness. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.